Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, nice to see all of you here for our fourth uh, lecture uh, series in the Privacy Speakers Series installments, the last one before we take a break for the summer. And as you know, these are uh, widely rebroadcast and get quite a few um, uh, listeners out there uh, on the web uh, through the, um, the, their retransmission on the, uh, uh, from our website. Alors, au, au cours de cette série de conférences... During our uh, series of conferences, uh, the OPC uh, was involved in interesting uh, conversations. Uh, uh, we uh, spoke with experts and Canadians, uh, and we spoke about contemporary issues uh, pertaining to uh, uh, privacy. Uh, we invited uh, specialists from various uh, fields to uh, speak about uh, the uh, protection of privacy in order to inspire us and to uh, dwell furthermore in the matter. These uh, were uh, recorded uh, for prosperity and uploaded on the internet and they were quite popular. The context and, and in fact I'll, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the uh, events that have taken place so I'll just remind everybody out there of them. The first speaker series event with Jesse Hirsch and Chris Segoyan sparked discussion around the future of privacy. Next, we talked about the challenges of negotiating privacy online with Christina nippert Eng and Alessandro Acquisti. We then followed that up with a discussion about opportunities for privacy in the design of intimate devices like smartphones and sensor-rich environments with Adam Greenfield and Aza Raskin. Clearly, the global trend is moving towards increased surveillance by private organizations, by governments, and even by one another. Despite the efforts of many, this trend is not slowing down. So our talk today centers on surveillance, either by government or on its behalf. We will also consider the role of surveillance in law enforcement and national security measures. It's a timely and worthwhile discussion as we approach the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy. Notre commissariat a établi quatre priorités. First of the Privacy Commissioner has established four long-term uh, objective uh, education uh, of uh, the public and the first uh, is the public safety which involves control, traditional control by the government and also uh, responsibilities pertaining to national security. The relationship uh, between uh, uh, public security and uh, Privacy protections are intertwined. There are right, fundamental rights which coexist. But nonetheless, we have to continue to insist that the right to protect one's privacy should not be affected by uh, the uh, protection measures taken for uh, national protections and uh, the application of law. Uh, nous avons for privacy is twin rights, fundamental, unalienable rights that should not only coexist but flourish in tandem. Dr. David Mirakami Wood, one of our distinguished speakers today, has spoken, and I quote, of a tacit social contract, I guess this is Rousseau for the 21st century, under which individuals expect to be free and to have those freedoms protected. Il a souligné que le principal motif qui milite en faveur de la sécurité est qu'il uh, def defends uh, privacy and uh, that we have the right to live our lives on a daily basis without being worried. Uh, we could. Et c'est à partir du moment où cette protection commence à empiéter sur nos libertés fundamentales. When the, 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 the asset contract is uh, affected, uh, when uh, uh, privacy is affected, and uh, it, Dr. Fassett says that other guests this afternoon has argued that our commitment to the rule of law and due process is critically important to civic trust. Extraordinary powers erode that trust, the very social contract that Professor Mirakami Wood alludes to. And at the same time, Professor Forsese in his work has noted that the emerging scale of globalized surveillance and information collection has now reached a point where localized privacy laws may become moot. 
Today's discussion with David Mirakemi, Wood and Craig Forsese will examine the privacy risks in a society that is placing its citizens under greater surveillance with each passing year. I look forward to a stimulating and thought-provoking afternoon with both of them, as you do too, I'm sure. So with that, I'll pass the floor over to our moderator for today, Christopher Prince of the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. Thank you. Well, I don't think uh, I have a lot to add to that introduction. Um, that sets the stage nicely. Our office, uh, three and a half years ago, embarked on a, a decision to start to focus on some specific fields. Uh, one of them was genetics. One of them was information technology. One of them was the protection of identity. And then the, the fourth was uh, national security and public safety programs. And in that context, we have tried to understand how surveillance tech, new surveillance technologies are changing uh, privacy expectations, how um, these are affecting um, citizens' understanding of, of their own rights. And so our, our invitation to our, our two experts today was interested in hearing about the cutting edge uh, in, of developments in this area. So I, I am only interested in hearing what you guys have to say, and so I'm going to turn it over to you. I think we've decided uh, Dave's going to go first. Thank you, um, and good afternoon to everyone. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here and to speak to an audience which is actually completely and totally interested in these issues. Um, so I don't have to do the usual thing of trying to persuade you you should be interested in the first place. What I'm going to do today, as has been alluded to, is to talk about surveillance technologies at the cutting edge. In doing so, I am not going to imply that we should be able to simply read off from these technologies some social factors or social outcomes. I am going to try not to be technologically determinist in that sense. However, I am going to point out the trends and trajectories of technological development and to draw off some implications and some uh, matters for discussion, particularly for regulators like the Privacy uh, Commissioner. Before I do look at those particular technologies, I want to identify and to outline some general trends that are going on in terms of socio-technological development. And I talk about socio-technological development not in some obscure academic way, but because as we know, for many, for many of us and in a lot of our lives, technology now is central. In fact, many of the arguments we have that are social and political arguments are really arguments about technology. Um, our lives have become infused with technologies. Technologies provide us with the basis for our social networking, for our pleasures in many cases, uh, for, and be have become indispensable to the way we lead our lives. Some of us may not want it to be that way. Some of us may prefer it to be otherwise, but it is undoubtedly true that this has become the case. What I'm going to talk about briefly first is what trends in terms of surveillance technologies there are that are facilitating the kinds of developments I will talk about specifically in the short time we have. There are many trends one could identify. First of all, though, I will, I will try and pull out about, say, nine different kinds of trends, of which I will talk about three specific examples. The most obvious one is that we are now living in a society where almost everything that we do can be collected and stored as information. So almost everything we do can be recorded, can be stored for later use. It's a society in which it is becoming increasingly difficult to forget, socially to forget. And as we know, there are great benefits and values to being able to forget. In fact, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, who's published this great book, Delete, which some of you may know, has argued that forgetting is a, is a fundamental social value which we are now losing. Nevertheless, we are moving into a society in which the databasing of information, the keeping of information of all kinds, whether it be trivial or thought to be trivial or important, is becoming the case. And furthermore, particular organizations are seeking to concentrate such data into data warehouses. So the FBI in the USA has been establishing what it calls the investigative data warehouse to collect information on criminal activity and potential criminal activity all over the world, in all forms. And when we talk about the kind of data that is concentrated in data warehouses, we're not just talking about 
uh, simple information. We're talking about everything right up to complex visual information, the products of CCTV and video surveillance and drones flying over uh, the cities um, of Pakistan or indeed over Britain or the USA, or the borders of Canada and the USA, of course. So we're moving into a society in which the ubiquitous collection of information, or what I call ubiquitous surveillance, or UbiServe, is becoming a new normal, a new social norm. Almost the default position for society. At the same time, we're moving away from closed circuits of surveillance, that is the, the idea of closed circuit television, that is surveillance that is kept within a, a simple and closed network to open circuits of surveillance. Surveillance which is increasingly carried over wireless or even open networks, and which may even be crowdsourced, may involve people, multiple ordinary people, in collecting information and gathering it together. Behind all this, in some ways, are, are computing developments, including the, uh, the development of the cloud system of, of, of storing information in vast server farms, which can be accessed from anywhere, supposedly anywhere on the planet. Of course, these server farms are proprietary in many cases, and have back doors operated by various governments. There are many problems with those. This is also a world in which the kind of information that we're storing is not just information about who we are, but also information about where we are and what we are doing. And location, as the Privacy Commissioner has already um, made a priority, is, is, is a very, very important area of privacy and privacy protection in the 21st century as is identification, as has already been alluded to earlier on. I won't go further into that. Just to say that, again, we're moving away from simple information towards complex forms of identification involving biometrics and kinds of uh, identification which are supposed to bypass all the traditional ways in which information was felt to be uh, unreliable. So the idea is to reach the real core of the person, who you really are, whether that be, be through a unique physical identifiers or increasingly through neurological identifiers, that is, brain waves and patterns of what we may be thinking. And we're seeing the movement of scanning technologies out of hospitals and into other um, forms of, of, of use. However, this is not all just being done by governments or even just by corporations. As has already been mentioned, increasingly we are involved in this kind of uh, spread of ubiquitous surveillance. Sometimes we are happily involved. Sometimes we take great pleasure in this. Sometimes this facilitates our social lives. But it's certainly true that in some extent, and I use this word very, very guardedly here, there is a democratization of surveillance. And we can argue about that word afterwards because I think it's very loaded and comes with just as many problems as the idea of democracy comes in our conventional understanding of the word. But certainly we're moving to smaller, cheaper, more portable forms of technology that have greater power and can be more intrusive and indeed um, more pervasive. What I'm going to talk about today in detail are three kinds of trends within this broad framework of surveillance technological trajectories. The first of these relates to and I can't show you the pictures, unfortunately, because my computer decided it wasn't compatible with the system here. So obviously this ubiquitous surveillance society doesn't work perfectly yet. Relates to size. It may in some ways seem almost uh, redundant to say that things are getting smaller. We're used to the fact that our mobile phones have moved from the 1980s, where there were huge brick-sized objects, down to things that you can fit in the palm of your hand, or indeed could be much smaller if we didn't need to still use our unfortunately large fingers to operate them. They could be a lot smaller. So surveillance technologies are also following this trend. What I'm going to briefly introduce here is some of the, if you like, the cutting edge of these kinds of surveillance technologies. And I'm going to pose some questions about what these technologies might mean for the regulation and promotion of personal privacy. These tiny forms of sensors which generally work on a kind of wireless or RFID basis, that is radio frequency identification basis or radio frequency basis at least, um, have moved in the last 10 years from being devices that you can actually see physically are large devices, maybe two or three square centimeters, down to being prototypes of 0 0.2, 0 0.4 millimeters squared, 
produced by Dust Networks of California, uh, so-called Smart Dust, which came out of a Berkeley University research project, to now, in the latest iteration, produced by Hitachi of Japan, in their so-called um, RFID powder, being 0.025 square millimeters in size. Now, I did have a picture of this to show you to illustrate just how small these things are. And at the risk of sounding extremely banal, they are very, very, very small. <laughs> in fact, you could have hundreds of these RFID powder particles on your hand, um, and you would have difficulty seeing them in some cases. They're very, very, very small. Um, OK, this sounds interesting in itself, but why are, these, why are these particularly worrying? Well, first of all, we're very used to surveillance devices, at least in, in public space, being fairly visible. Public space surveillance and mass surveillance has generally been something that we can look up on the corners of buildings and say, look, there's a camera. There's a CCTV camera. We can see it. And if we can see it, it can be at least controlled, regulated in some way. If we know it's there, at least we can try to discover information about who operates this, what is being done with the information. But that first stage of being able to know that a surveillance device is present in any particular place is very, very important to the regulation of public area surveillance and of mass surveillance more generally. Now, of course, spies and intelligence services have used invisible and covert devices forever. This is not completely new at all by any means. However, what we're talking about here is the ready availability on the commercial market of devices which are, to all intents and purposes, invisible, not just to casual observation, but to detailed searching uh, in a conventional sense, obviously in a non-technical, uh, non-expert sense. We would not know, for example, if in this room there were thousands of RFID powders, particles. How would we know? unless you had wireless scanning devices of various kinds, especially if they were not actually operational at the time. Now, if we don't know that these devices are present, how are we then going to go about trying to regulate these devices? What can we say? We can say we can ban them. We can ban their production. Again, how would you know if they were being installed or used? And I think we can talk about the legal implications of this, and maybe later on this might be covered. But of course, this is not the end of this development in terms of just a pure size of devices. And of course, there are still much bigger devices and more complex surveillance equipment still needs to be of a certain size. Cameras, for example, are still have a certain limitation in how small they can get based on the sizes of lenses and so on, uh, the workable sizes of lenses. However, we are moving into an age in which we're moving from micro to nano technologies, perhaps even smaller devices that can be secreted into the bloodstream that carry out surveillance activities for very beneficial purposes, medical surveillance and so on. Um, these kinds of devices I'm talking about will maybe be seen as rather large in 50 to 100 years' time. So size is one of the first things, and I would like to point out that size matters, maybe not in the way that we're usually used to. The second area I would like to move to when I'm talking about the vanishing of surveillance, which is my theme for today, is not about things becoming invisible through becoming smaller and smaller, but because, as things becoming invisible because they start to look like other things. They start to look like things that we are used to seeing in the world. Now, I'm not talking here just about surveillance cameras being painted to fit into the background. This does happen in, in some countries, especially in Japan, where I've done a lot of research, I have noticed that the aestheticization of camera technology and of security technology is proceeding apace, where cameras are painted or covered to blend in with the environment so as not to spoil that architectural presentation. But that's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm going to talk about here today is so-called biomimetics. Now, biomimetics in this context refers to technological devices, robots of various kinds, which imitate the forms of natural devices, natural systems, natural devices, natural systems of some kind. Um, and in this context, we're talking about remote controlled or increasingly more independently in mobile and autonomous devices that, to all intents and purposes, will look like something natural. 
And again, if I'd had the pictures, I could have shown you. But just to say, if you want to look at these things later, just put um, nano hummingbird into Google. And you'll come up with a very interesting series of videos in which you can see um, a particular biomimetic device um, in operation. This is a prototype, the nano hummingbird, that has been developed out of an um, American defense research program funded by DARPA. Um, it's produced by a company called AeroVironment. Now, AeroVironment's nano hummingbird is something that to the casual observer, if you saw it flying around and didn't spare it a second glance, looks like a hummingbird. It flies around with little, little wings. It's about the right size of a hummingbird. Um, it can be remote controlled, but it also has heuristic devices in, with installed with it, so it does react to its environment as well. Um, this device is not just intended to be a bit of fun. It is part of a military project, and it is intended as a platform for sensors of various kinds. In fact, the ultimate aim of this project is to produce autonomous um, robots that can actually draw power from their environment. So the aim is to produce things that, for example, could sit on an electricity cable, draw power, and fly off and operate in any place in the world. At the moment, the one thing that stops them being seen as natural is the noise they make. Um, obviously, servo motors and, the, and the, the noise they make when they're flying means that they look like a rather noisy hummingbird, a rather angry hummingbird, perhaps. Um, and that, that, at the moment, is, is something that makes them not perfectly biomimetic. But again, the trend here towards objects that are not what they appear to be, that, that surveillance platforms that are not what they appear to be, um, is, 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 is quite clear. There's also other trends in this area and other devices being developed. Insects are proving to be a very valuable model for many of the research groups working in this area. Um, and there's also, at least uh, in a working prototype in Israel, of a uh, surveillance snake, um, which is being produced by a company called Technion, which is connected to the Israeli defense establishment. Um, I think Raytheon, a subsidy of Raytheon in the USA, is also working on a biomimetic surveillance snake as well. Um, it's a slightly less advanced stage. They're having problems with the movement. Now, these devices, of course, have some extremely laudable purposes. The surveillance snake, for example, is, is being put forward as being a device for getting into uh, hard-to-reach places in the collapse of buildings or after earthquakes, where obviously you need to get vision into places to see if someone is trapped under this pile of rubble or not. However, of course, they're also, one should bear in mind, being developed by military research companies who have their own agendas, which are not of such a laudable quality, at least too many of us. So we have devices out there which are increasingly small, increasingly invisible. We have a whole series of other devices being developed which are not what they appear to be, which are disguised, camouflaged. Um, and this again poses problems for regulation for largely the same reasons as the size problem. Again, what does one to do if the things you are trying to regulate are trying to appear to be something different? How is one to tell whether a bird that is flying by is really a bird that is flying by, or a surveillance camera? And again, what is one to do about this? One of the final, um, the final area I'm going to talk about today, and we could go on talking about random examples of technology for a long time, but these are designed to make some particular points, which I'll come back to. The final area I will, I will refer to is the changes in research involving body scanners. Now, we've all become very familiar with body scanners in Canada, particularly since the uh, Transportation Security Administration of the USA and followed then by the Canadian border agencies uh, themselves instituted these devices at airports following the uh, so-called thigh bombers attempt to bring down the plane on Christmas Day over Detroit. Now, these body scanners have caused controversy as they are already. These are devices which, if you're not familiar with them, and I'm sure you all are, you have to walk through, in many cases at airports now, which, which perform what is called a virtual strip search, or what I've referred to as a virtual strip search. They essentially can see under clothing without actually the clothing being removed. And for some people, this is an improvement on the kind of searches that we could be conducted at airports. It's certainly less physically intrusive than having a full body pat down or a strip search. And in fact, when I talk to my students about this, at least half of them find this to be more acceptable than physical searching. We've become used to these kind of searches, though. They're, they are there, they cause controversy, there's argument, but they are at least visible. One can know when one's approaching 
a device like this at an airport. They're big. You have to walk through a gate of some kind. They're obvious. And therefore, at least, can be discussed, can be regulated. However, it has recently been uh, at least uh, theorized, and it's now being moved into more than a theoretical arena, that some of these technologies involved in body scanning don't have to be this bulky. They don't have to be take place in large devices such as the body scanners one sees at airports. In fact, terahertz wave scanning, which is one of the three major technologies used in these devices, um, not actually the most common, it's actually the least common in terms of airport scanners. Terahertz wave scanning, it seems, can be used now at very small scales and can be fitted onto the standard kind of silicon CMOS technology that we're used to using in cameras and video cameras. Now, okay, we're a long way from even prototyping, let alone commercial production in this area. But imagine for a minute the implications of having a chip that can adapt, essentially adapt a video camera into a body scanner. Okay? This is what we're talking about. And they are talking about, by the way, the researcher involved in this as being output that is, quote, good enough for video and which can be built in these arrays which can be used in portable equipment. This is a long-term development. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It might not happen in 20, 30, 50 years' time. But it's something that seems at least now to be possible. And if it seems to be possible, you can bet your bottom dollar there will be people who will develop it commercially. Now, why this is interesting, first of all, is A, it means that anybody could carry around body scanning equipment that would look very much like conventional cameras. Um, and the, the kind of invisibility that we're talking about here is the invisibility, if you like, of expectation. We know what cameras and video cameras in general do. Okay, they've got more powerful, they've got more sophisticated, but we know fundamentally what they do and when they're operating. If someone is taking a picture of you, you can pretty much expect what kind of picture is being taken. We certainly do not expect that person to be taking a picture of us under our clothes. Superman doesn't really exist. X-ray vision doesn't really exist. Or does it? So what we're talking about here again is, is a kind of new form of invisible surveillance, a kind of surveillance that actually piggybacks onto existing forms of technology and, if you like, subverts the kind of expectations we have of those technologies' purpose and capability. OK, like everything else, we may well get used to these kind of things. It may well change our expectations of what cameras are used for, but in itself, it may, may not pose a problem for some people. We'll come back to that in a minute. I think there are some key questions about all of these technological trends, just, not just the ones I've outlined uh, briefly today, but also the various array of other kinds of technological developments that are going on. And these are in sort of several forms. First of all, the big question is how do these kinds of technological developments affect the way we think about ourselves and our relationships? We've already had plenty of research to suggest there is both a change in some ways, a transformation and a decline in trust within society as a result of the increasing surveillance. It's not that it always damages trust, but it certainly transforms the nature of how we interact with other people. And these kinds of devices, the presence or the likely presence of invisible surveillance technologies as a normal factor of everyday life is again likely to change the way in which we experience social relationships between each other. The nature of trust between people, the nature of what one can expect to do or not to do in various spaces. Um, how that exactly will happen is the question we may want to discuss. If you look back at various science fiction novels of the 20th century, the existence of these kind of technologies has been proposed by various authors, and they've come to different conclusions. Some authors have proposed that ubiquitous invisible surveillance would create a new kind of Eden in which no one can have any secrets, so everyone is perfectly open, and the society evolves in which we are all like children again, happy that everything is known, in which there can be no evil. On the other hand, the, uh, the other more common uh, verdict from science fiction writers and from, of course, research we've done more recently in, in sociology and social sciences is that, in fact, this creates a certain kind of uh, sense of, well, first of all, anxiety and, of course, right up to oppression and uh, various forms of government abuse. The other question to ask about these technologies is, does one need to think about them as a threat? 
if one sees surveillance having multiple purposes, some of which may indeed be purposes which we approve of, can these technologies be seen at least potentially as empowering in some way? Not maybe to the extent of creating a new Eden, but to the extent of maybe facilitating, um, say, richer sensory environments for people whose sensory environments are deprived in various ways, those people who have um, hearing or visual disabilities and so on. Can some of these kinds of devices help in establishing a richer sensory experience in society for those kinds of people, indeed for all of us? Possibly. How will these technologies themselves adapt to our use? It's not so much that technologies just determine how we behave, but it's how will we as people, and that includes everybody from government agencies with the kinds of powers that they have down to individuals who may use these technologies at a more intimate level, how do we, how will our use change these technologies and transform the paths which they take? And whose demands and whose use will be most important in transforming these technologies? So if you like, in a, more, in a more kind of academic sense, what is the political economy of these kinds of technologies? You know, who owns them? What interests do they serve? And so on. And how can law and regulators cope with these transformations? I've got a few thoughts just before I finish on what the kinds of options are for regulation in an environment of vanishing surveillance technologies. And by the way, I should say that I don't mean all surveillance technologies are vanishing. In fact, there's a, a completely counter trend to this, which is actually showing, you know, is increasing visibility of surveillance technologies too, so we can discuss that afterwards. But what are the options for regulation in this case? I'll briefly outline some, and maybe these questions will be dealt with in more detail by the second speaker. Um, we shall see. One is, of course, that we continue to, to try to enforce the kinds of existing rules and rights that we have in much the same way as we've always done. In other words, people like the Privacy Commissioner carry on as normal. We just take our privacy rights as normative, as something we should defend, and carry on trying to defend them in very much the same way, and hoping that this establishes or keeps on privacy as a normative value. That basically, the norm of privacy beats out the norm of ubiquitous surveillance through its continued promotion and use. Indeed, this is a strategy that privacy commissions throughout the world have taken, you know, is to remind people they do have privacy, to keep just talking privacy. Second option is to, maybe in the face of some of these kinds of technologies, to almost ignore them and do nothing. Essentially to argue we can't do anything about these. There's nothing one can do. It's not our domain. We can only really regulate technologies that are you know, visible and obvious, and that's all we can do. Or in fact, to go further, even encourage them in some cases. One could decide that some of these technologies have positive values, positive social values, and should be encouraged. Again, this is something we can discuss. Then there, of course, there are technological solutions, and indeed the Ontario Privacy Commissioner, Anne Kovokian, has been for many years advocating privacy by design, and if you like, built-in privacy solutions as the answer to many of these kinds of problems. Um, there are many issues with privacy by design as a solution or as an only solution, uh, which again, we can be probably all familiar with and which we can talk about in more detail. But certainly it encourages a reliance on the very same corporations who are developing these technologies to do the right thing in various ways, which in itself is problematic. One might of course go further and encourage the development of anti-surveillance or sous-surveillance technologies. So counter-surveillance technologies to counteract these kind of things. And of course, if there's a market for surveillance technologies, there will certainly be a market for counter surveillance technologies and things which counteract what these platforms and systems do. So, you know, jamming devices that knock out little hummingbird drones, kind of electronic hoovers that sweep up RFID powder. These kind of things certainly will be something we'll be seeing more of. Of course, in many ways, these technological solutions rely on another set of solutions, which are market solutions. Um, and essentially, we have to ask in this case, if we're going to rely on market solutions to these kind of problems, are privacy, anonymity, and unlocatability economically valuable? And who to? And we soon find out the problem with these kind of market solutions is that the people to whom these are economically valuable are those who already have extensive resources, and those who are not um, do not have access to the same resources 
may equally find that their privacy, their anonymity, and their unlocatability are not regarded as being valuable in market terms. And finally, there's many other solutions, but the final thing I'll mention today is old-fashioned hard regulation. What I mean by this is the use of the law to try to ban, outlaw, or limit the use of technologies like these. Now, clever use of legal intervention can make a difference. And I'll give you one example here. When digital cameras were first introduced, digital, ordinary digital uh, picture cameras, what was found in some countries, and this is especially true in, in, in Korea and Japan, was that perverts essentially were using these cameras to take what was called upskirt pictures of women, especially on escalators or in public places, because these cameras didn't make any sound. They had no need to make a sound. So you could take pictures very easily, and no one would know that a, a surreptitious picture had been taken of, of, of them in, an area, in a way that they did not want. So Korea first, and then Japan, and some other jurisdictions too, introduced a law to make these cameras produce an audible click. So they sounded like old-fashioned SLR cameras. And this is why, by the way, all or most cameras now make an audible click, even though they don't have to. Because most of cameras, of course, are made in these areas in Korea and Japan, and they follow these routes, and other jurisdictions have now followed suit as well. Now, this suggests one route that one might want to pursue to dealing with these kinds of technologies. It's, it's kind of a privacy by design, but it's not really. It's not building in privacy, it's building in warning of surveillance in use, if you like. It's difficult to see how some of these other devices might, be might use this kind of uh, route. Maybe you could have a hummingbird flashing an orange light on its chest as it flies about. Or, you know, rather like the reverse signals on, on uh, trucks and lorries. Who knows? There's various routes one might go down this, down, down this way. But certainly there is a, a question of, the, the, of hard regulation that could be used. Of course, there are problems here of enforcement, of legitimate use, of different jurisdictions which don't comply with the same norms, and the fact that you could still purchase devices without these built-in controls from other places, and so on. And of course, of power imbalances in the first place, which underlie a lot of the problems that we have with surveillance. OK, that's all I'm going to say today. And I, I would hope that we can have some fruitful uh, material for discussion. And I'd like to pass on to my co-speaker to talk about the more legal issues associated with trends in surveillance. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. And thanks to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for inviting uh, me here today. Uh, uh, I was asked when I was in, invited to speak to, to give sort of a blue sky thought about uh, privacy and national security and surveillance. And I welcome that opportunity because as an academic typically involved in doctrinal matters, I'm, I'm very rarely given an opportunity to think well, big thoughts essentially around, uh, around social trends and the like. And I thought uh, in part inspired by a, a recent book that some of you may be familiar with, a book by uh, James Gleick called The Intelligence. Uh, which examines our transition from what he calls information poor societies to information rich societies. I thought I, I would take this concept of a uh, transmutation from information poor societies to information rich societies of the sort that David was talking about and look at it through the optic of privacy law and most particularly the optic of conventional search and seizure protections, which of course part of our constitutional settlement here in Canada, Section 8 of the Charter, and also best known perhaps for many others is the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So what I wanted to do is, is look at the evolution of those search and seizure protections and ask whether they work in an information-rich society. And so to begin this conversation, I suppose I, I should uh, try to define what I, what I mean when I say that law is reactive. Uh, my hypothesis here is that the law reflects uh, social trends rather than perhaps anticipating social trends. It's a, it's a lagging indicator. Uh, and so as we convert from information poor to information rich societies, uh, the law is often ill-equipped really to grapple with the challenges. And, and so my, my overarching theme is that frankly our conventional search and seizure concepts are inadequate. They're broken when it comes to information rich societies, which then presents a more difficult conversation about how we regulate uh, information rich uh, societies from a privacy perspective. All right, so to start us off then, uh, surveillance and privacy in information poor environments. And so um, Gleek in his, in his book talks about 
bytes. He talks about the units of information being bytes. And so in an information poor society, bytes are confined to finite sources. Bytes are found, information is found in people's brains. And in literate societies, bytes are found in written documents. Uh, but they have a geographic location, a finite geographic location, and these bytes do. And so uh, I shall call this first period, the starting point in this conversation about information poor societies, I'm going to call it the Gutenberg period uh, to represent sort of the, well, the superior technology of the day, right? Sort of early modernity and the invention of the printing press. Well, what sort of protections evolve in relation to privacy during the Gutenberg era? Uh, well, the key uh, preoccupation, privacy protections in the common law tradition, reflected now in our constitutional doctrine here in Canada, the US, and other jurisdictions, but incidentally also poorly reflected in international law, is, is what I'll call the Camden paradigm. And I call it the Camden paradigm uh, to honor uh, Lord Camden, the author of two pivotal cases in the 18th century, uh, which in turn galvanized the founding fathers of the United States to codify privacy protections in the Fourth Amendment. All right, so Lord Camden is my shorthand for that conventional protection against search and seizure by the state. All right. Now, in relation to, I can't quite see my slides here. In relation to the Camden paradigm, uh, if one were to examine really what it boils down to, boiled down to its essence, the Camden paradigm is about uh, control over a space, which I'll call a space of personal sovereignty. It's a zone of personal sovereignty where the state cannot intrude. It is essentially a variant on that old chestnut that an Englishman's home, uh, home is his castle. Right? And, and again, it's a property-centered concept in its original impetus. It protects against search and seizure within the confines of one's physical premises. Now, that works OK in a purely information-poor environment. Again, remember, in an information-poor environment, bytes are housed in person, person's brains, and they're housed on paper. And the paper itself, itself is fixed in space. It's got its own geography, and if it's in your house, you can't go after it. So the protection of privacy, the protection of what's written and in your brain in large measure, is about protecting your personal sovereignty in your own ge geographic zone, those zones where uh, the state can't intrude. All right. So there's, a, there's an overlap, a coincidence in the Camden model between privacy protection and the protection of, of, of space, personal sovereignty. It's not actually about protecting the information per se, Camden. All right. It's not about protecting the bytes. Now, how well does this model work as we evolve from a, into a more information-rich environment? So now I'm taking us up the chain here, uh, evolving towards our, our, our current predicament. And so I'm moving forward to what I'll call the Morse era. I'm you know, being a bit trite here. But as you imagine, the Morse era is a period in which technology has evolved to the point that one, in the confines of one's own home, can whisper into some electronic device and converse then with someone far distant. And so now we have... Uh, remote communication, which changes the privacy paradigm. How well does the Camden model work in this context? Well, if one's to look to the early jurisprudence applying this search and seizure Camden style doctrine to electronic communication, the answer from the US Supreme Court is it has no applicability at all. And so you have cases like Olmsted from the 1930s, where at issue was a wiretap. And the US Supreme Court in response to the question as to whether the Fourth Amendment search and seizure protections extend to a wiretap, said no. All right. The communication was tapped on the lines that run between these two houses, and the person communicating had no reason to believe that their communication should be private. It's in a public space. It's run along these lines. That was the Olmsted decision. Now, of course, that position, as we all know, is not the uh, dominant position in our modern context. Why? Because the US Supreme Court, in a case that was ultimately very influential in our own constitutional jurisprudence, a case called Katz, essentially reversed Olmsted and created what we now know is the doctrine of reasonable expectation of privacy. All right, it's all a term, I'm a term I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, the notion that uh, there are zones, if you will, there are uh, zones in which a person has both a subjective sense uh, that they will, what they do will be private, and also that expectation is objectively a reasonable one. So the reasonable expectation of privacy doctrine. Now note that the preoccupation, even with this concept of reasonable expectation of privacy, is about zones. It's not about protecting bytes. It's not about protecting information. It's about zones in which one has this special 
expectation, this expectation of privacy. And so if one looks to our current modern jurisprudence in the, from the, our Supreme Court, for example, the most recent iteration in a case called Gombeck from 2010, uh, there's a class now of information that the Supreme Court is, pre is prepared to give constitutional protection known as informational privacy. And just to quote here, the claims of individuals, groups, or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. That's the doctrine within the Camden model that comes close, closest to actually protecting the bytes themselves from intrusion. The problem is that not all sorts of bytes attract this informational category protection. Why? Because, uh, as the Supreme Court goes on to say, the Charter is protecting a biographical core of personal information. And so there's, there are certain forms of information which attack, attract this protection. It's not true for all sorts of information. And exactly what sort of information, which bytes, fall within the zone is a matter of some dispute. And so in Gombeck itself, of course, that issue was whether, uh, in that case, uh, disclosing information about electricity consumption is invasive or revelatory of a respondent's private life. The majority said, no, it's not invasive. Dissent said exactly the inverse. And so we have these debates now in our constitutional jurisprudence about what zones attract and deserve uh, this constitutional protection. And in essence, the debate about the lawful access provisions that I'm sure we'll see in Parliament again is just an extension of that same uh, concern. I mean, is this the sort of interest that attracts the Camden paradigm or not? The problem, though, and now I need to move forward to the information rich society about which David was talking about, is that this Camden model of trying to segment the world and information within the world into zones where one has expectations of privacy versus those that don't, don't work very well and an information-rich society. And so the information-rich society, I'll give it a label as well. I'm going to call it the Turing era, in honor of uh, Alan Turing, who's the, considered the forebearer of computer science, the emitter of the modern computer. And so in the Turing era, we now have not just the geographically diffuse uh, communications uh, that were characteristic of the Morse era, but more than that, and more radically than that, we have the recording of data and the accumulation of data in permanent form of the sort that David was talking about, in massive quantity. And so we're not talking about the stenographer anymore in the Olmsted case. We're talking about recording of communications and of data debris, if you will, of all sorts at high levels of fidelity forever and archivable forever. And so in that context, let me propose to you that Camden does not work. And there are two principal reasons, there are probably more than two, but there are two principal reasons I want to identify why the Camden paradigm, the conventional search and seizure concept, does not work in an information-rich society. The first, uh, a term that uh, you're familiar with, I'm just going to check to see that I'm in the right place of my slides here. Looks like I might be one behind. Uh, the first problem is what I'll call the mosaic effect. And for those of you who follow national security conversations, the mosaic effect is often invoked as a government justification for secrecy. And it goes like this, that we cannot disclose this seemingly innocuous piece of information because if we were to disclose this innocuous piece of information, it could be pieced together by uh, a potential adversary with other pieces of innocuous information. And together, this information so pieced together would form a mosaic that would be pernicious to national security. Right. Mosaic effect has been recognized by our courts as a doctrine in terms of, of government uh, refusals to disclose information, but it can also be turned on its head from a privacy perspective. And so from a privacy perspective, the mosaic uh, goes something like this, that while my little piece of data or that little bite that I produce in my everyday conduct, each individual piece may not itself be pernicious to my privacy interest, accumulated, collected, and compiled, and then mined it can paint a portrait that collectively creates a mosaic that basically abolishes my privacy. Okay. So the mosaic effect is a real prospect in an information-rich society where, again, these technologies exist that allow this compilation and uh, the preservation of this information. And uh, to give you some sense as to these technologies, uh, David talked about some examples. Uh, Jane Mayer, who is a, a journalist with The New Yorker, best known for some of her very powerful journalism on, uh, on the post 9-11 environment 
and, and uh, rights protections in the United States. In her May edition of New Yorker wrote an article, a very interesting article on the Thin Thread Project that came out of the National Security Agency back in the 1990s, which was about basically using various databases of different sorts, GPS, car rentals, et cetera, et cetera, piecing all this together to form very sophisticated portraits of, of, of what people were up to. Uh, and of course, now fast forward 11, 12 years, you can imagine the technology has evolved uh, even more uh, greatly. How well does our conventional law approach this mosaic effect? Short answer, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, our courts have not been prepared to recognize the mosaic concept in relation to privacy protections. They are still preoccupied with identifying the privacy inter interest associated with individual tidbits, if you will, of bytes. They have not gone beyond that and posed the question, well, what about the compilation? What about the big picture? What about the mosaic? The closest, in terms of a court case, the closest that uh, we've come is actually a decision, a recent decision, 2010 of the, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia in the United States called Maynard. And at issue of Maynard was actually a prolonged and very intensive surveillance by police force in that case of someone's uh, driving essentially. Uh, and so from a conventional privacy protection or reasonable expectation of privacy doctrine, you're out in the public roads, you're driving around, you're in the public eye, and therefore there's no Fourth Amendment preoccupation. There's no privacy interest that's triggered. Now, this is not within that protected zone. The Maynard Court, the Court of Appeal, said this surveillance was prolonged, it was intensive, and the duration and the intensity of the surveillance made this qualitatively very different than it would otherwise have been. And because of that duration, because of that intensity, and they invoke the concept of the mosaic effect, this is in the guarded area that's protected by the Fourth Amendment. And the police should have had a warrant, and they didn't. Information's tossed. Okay, that's the closest we've, we've come. Not aware of any equivalent jurisprudence within, within Canada. Second issue uh, associated with the uh, Turing era. And I've alluded to this, not just the mosaic effect, but also persistence, the problem of persistence, the problem of permanence. So once upon a time, with different technologies, the data, the bytes that spin off you as you conduct your everyday affairs, uh, they couldn't be compiled, they couldn't be archived, except with great difficulty and kept permanently. They couldn't be searched with great effectiveness. That's very different now. When, as David suggested, this information is amenable to seizure, uh, is amenable to archiving and storage of indefinite duration. And so the problem of permanence is essentially one of data mining becoming data archaeology. And so, uh, as David suggested, we can't forget anymore. And something that you did, say, in the Vancouver riots, 10 years from now, may have an implication for your ability to get some job somewhere else, although long past. Okay. So there's a temporal dimension, if you will, to privacy protections uh, that is really quite more, more profound now than it was in the past. And, and it raises the same preoccupations of the mosaic effect. If one's trying to apply that Camden search and seizure doctrine and say to a judge, well, uh, this little piece of information doesn't seem important now, but years from now, in compilation with all, this other thing, all these other things that are spin off, spin off from my everyday life, it could pose this mosaic that's actually quite pernicious to privacy, Good luck trying to persuade a judge to pr play the role of, of, uh, of trying to predict the actual trajectory of that innocuous piece of information in the future and extend some sort of protection to, to that seemingly innocuous piece of information. Uh, last point I'll make in terms of the Turing era, and it's one that David referred to, is the facility by which information flows. At a click of a mouse, the data dump crosses the border. Right, we're all familiar with the Arar case, right? The data dump. In that case, it was CDs. We wouldn't have to use CDs anymore, I suppose. CDs that were uh, provided by the RCMP to American authorities, from undigested intelligence information. Information is fungible in a way because of these technologies that it was never before. And because it's fungible, it means it moves between different jurisdictions with different levels of protection. And the fear, of course, in the Turing era, is that information will be protected only insofar as the level of protection that exists in the least protective jurisdiction, the downward harmonization prospect. Uh, and David and I were chatting today about the prospect of server farms being 
placed offshore in jurisdictions where it might be economical to place server farms, but where the protections offered in terms of privacy law are non-existent or are quite poor. All right. And so there's a prospect then of information being collected and moved uh, in ways that, uh, well, do an end run in some large measure against the seemingly now quaint domestic legal protections that privacy law typically garners. And that would be true for the Camden paradigm. Imagine uh, some prospect of trying to ask um, a Canadian judge to approve uh, the receipt by CSIS through an information sharing arrangement of information that the NSA may have collected uh, in the course of its own investigations. It's hard to imagine that a judge would play that role. And moreover, it would be a rubber stamp if the NSA is telling CSIS, here's information of national security concern, and CSIS is obliged to go to a judge, well, what's the point of that? The judge is not going to stand in the way of information that's already established as having national security significance. Camden only works to preclude the invasion of privacy in the first place. It doesn't work as a back-end prophylactic against uh, privacy that's already been violated. OK. So that then leads us to a final discussion. And I'll just conclude on this beyond Camden. I mean, what do we do with all this? And I have no perfect solution. Um, but let me propose uh, a few principles that I, I think are probably worth discussion. Uh, the first I'll call disaggregation and the firewall. And this is going to be familiar to everyone in this room. Uh, uh, to some extent, I think that the, the battle over collection is, is, is over. The information is too readily accessible. It's too easy to collect. The new battle is what happens to the information once collected. Okay. And the idea of the mother of all databases, right, the, the total information awareness database, serving as a depository for all uh, this information that can be sucked up from the ether and then mined, uh, of, of course, is, is quite controversial. It's controversial in the United States. It's something to be avoided. Uh, information obviously has to be collected and disaggregated. And the firewalls between the disaggregated databases have to be preserved. Now, there will be instances where the firewall needs to be pierced. There could be bona fide reasons why a government agency should be able to run, for example, search through the cumulative databases, the, the linked, the chained, firewall down databases the government may have in its possession. But in that circumstance, it seems to me they should have a warrant, called a firewall warrant, a warrant that allows them to pierce the firewalls, okay, in the same way that warrants are required to pierce the walls of your house. Well, depending on the technology you're using, according to the Supreme Court, right? Um, in the same way that conventional warrant powers are about search and seizures within zones of privacy, so too should there be firewall warrants that preserve databases from being linked and mined for data. Uh, associated with firewall warrants, logarithm warrants, uh, the authorization to conduct a search through the government's databases is not a trolling expedition. Much as it, with conventional warrants, you're obliged to specify the nature of your search, the parameters of your search, so too with database mining warrants, the logarithm itself should be approved. The search terms should be approved. What exactly are you going to mine? That has to be closely policed in advance of the mining. And then, third, minimization. Once the mining is conducted, you're going to end up with a lot of extraneous information. That has to be purged. Now, when do you purge? Right, from, uh, imagine there are investigators in this room, and of course they will tell me, and they tell all of us, that it's not going to be clear at the outset of an investigation what might turn out to be relevant at the back end of an investigation. So when do you purge? Well, at the very least, it seems to me that there should be time limits. And upon expiry of those time limits, six months, there has to be a renewal of the authorization to retain that data. Uh, much as there is, for example, when you have an intercept warrant under the criminal code, uh, there is a finite period of time in which you can conduct your intercept. After that, you have to go back to the judge and seek a renewal. So too, in terms of preserving the product of your database search, it should be finite in time, subject to reasonable renewal, supervised by an independent judicial officer. And then after the expiry of the warrant, once the search has been conducted, the investigation concluded, all the extraneous material should be purged. The risk, of course, is if you don't do the purge, you end up with the creation of parallel databases. You do enough searches through the master database, you keep everything you concluded, uh, and you end up with a parallel database that you can then search at will that's not subject to the firewall protections that I, I described before. Uh, fourth point, and this is where I, I suppose the, the most important role for a data commissioner is that of oversight. Uh, 
judges are not going to be in a position to audit exactly what happens with those firewalls. Making sure that there's not leakage between these firewalls that disaggregate these databases is going to have to be the job of an arm's length data commissioner or some other regulatory authority. Uh, and that means auditing. And, and this is very important. In a conventional Camden model search and seizure, there's an adversarial relationship. I have an interest as the proprietor of my own privacy in challenging an invasion of that privacy. If government, different government agencies are housing different databases, they're not quite in the same adversarial relationship. And so the fear is you might get cooperation or implicit a cooperation of some sort that allows leakage between databases. There's not the same adversarial relationship, which means you need an arm's length uh, a police uh, or policer or uh, regulator of some sort to control uh, the flow of information. And I'll conclude on the last point, compensation. Um, frontier issue for national security. Uh, lots of lawsuits now uh, that are in front of the courts about compensation for saying X to the Egyptian authorities that picked you up off the plane when you got to Egypt and took you in for special treatment. Should you be sued? Should you be liable for defamation? Right? Frontier area. I think compensation is an important area in this, in this uh, space as well when we talk about privacy. I think that uh, certainly compensation can never can never correct, if you will, can never make whole the violation of a privacy right. But it, it goes some way in terms of making one whole. It's the conventional approach of our law. But more than that, it's also a deterrent, especially if compensation is directed properly so that it's not something that necessarily the government as an institution is on the hook for, but there's the prospect of compensation of individuals being liable for their own conduct. A uh, fairly radical notion, I suspect. But the, individual, the idea of individual culpability for running amok uh, I think probably has a more important deterrent effect than any other form of compensation. All right. So I'm there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think before we turn to the audience, um, I just while listening to both talks, um, I recall we had a, an expert come in from the UK. His name was Dr. Peter Gill. Uh, I think he's at Manchester, and he's he's. I think he probably you both nodded, so I think you both probably would have been acquainted with his work. And he, he touched on, um, I think, the real complexities of, of exercising oversight in this, this era for the reasons that you described, this transnational movement of data, but also the invisibility of, the, of its collection methods and the scale of its collection methods. And so, so he came in and he gave, this, he gave a wonderful talk. Um, it was a great discussion, and he said one of the most difficult things, and I think you actually alluded to it this morning, is that, that we have moved to this model where it is, is an ocean of data sloshing around, but oversight is still very carefully compartmentalized. And, and, and in, um, you know, in, in military and intelligence jargon, I mean, I think the, the, the idea was is that you know, you had, for the longest time, you know, very strict access controls, very strict firewalls. But those firewalls are gone, but the oversight still is very stovepiped. And, and I'm, I guess this, is, this goes to your point about the law, the law being always, you know, 10, 20, 15 years behind the times. I mean, do, do you think there are, are legislative solutions to these problems? Or, or do you think, given its international scope, even a legislative solution is going to be is going to hit them, miss them. Let me take first stab at that. Okay, the, the answer is yes and no. I mean, the, the, you, can, you can't legislate these problems out of existence. But you know, l let me give you an example. This is uh, an example from the uh, from the area of uh, national security review. And I know there's some uh, CERC people here. And so I was at a conference in in Norway, and 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 they have their own national security oversight body. And at issue here was information exchange intelligence sharing arrangements. Uh, and so uh, in our own context, um, first of all, CERC has greater access, incidentally, to foreign provided intelligence than do a lot of equivalent review bodies. They, it's a black bo book for them. They can't, they can't go anywhere near information provided by intelligence service in terms of doing their, their performance audits or their review audits of security services. But one of the issues might well be, you can imagine this arising, that the information is provided to Canadian Security Intelligence Service by Australia. 
uh, and the information is procured in, and, and then it's used in some manner uh, that's pernicious to the, you know, the, the, the person in Australia who, 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 whose information it is or from whom it was collected. To whom do they complain? Okay. So do they have standing or competence to complain to the Australian oversight bodies? Well, presumably yes. But what does that matter at this point? Could they complain in Canada? Well, I would assume, incidentally, that, that the Australian would have, there's no nationality requirement in, this, in, this, in the CSIS Act. And so they could have competence, the, the CERC would have competence then to examine exactly how that information was used in Canada. That's not true for all jurisdictions. And so in Norway, they said the, the Australian would have no juris, they would no, be, no competence, we'd have no competency to actually hear the case from, from this Australian, okay, which seems surprising or perplexing to me. Uh, but this is, a, in other words, a call for greater interagency cooperation. And so there may be stovepiping on a national basis, but if all the stovepiped agencies were then to perform uh, some sort of cooperative arrangement so that information would, or, or complaints couldn't fall between cracks, that there was always someone who had carriage of the complaint, then that might go a long way to curing uh, some of the concerns that stovepiping might, uh, might otherwise raise. Okay. Now that doesn't require a very complicated legislative amendment. I don't think it would require any legislative amendment in Canada. And presumably, uh, in other jurisdictions, it would be fairly simple to open up sort of the standing rules to allow foreign nationals to make complaints. But it would require, presumably, some cooperation between uh, review bodies of like mind in, in terms of sort of coordinating what might be interjurisdictionally complicated investigations. So. There is potentially a role, a role for international law here as well, but as you mentioned earlier on, international law is even further <laughs> perhaps behind in some ways than some of the national jurisdictions in this, in this area, and it would be difficult to know how that would work, especially who would be, again, the person one might appeal to in this case. Um, the other thing is that, of course, any, any regulation that's adopted on an international basis opens up space for transgression of that regulation by particular jurisdictions who would see it in their advantage to, in their competitive advantage, to make a space for you know, a, a less uh, strict legal regime. In the same way that, for example, international shipping, which is supposedly regulated, but yes, you, know, you can go to Liberia or Panama and register your defunct single-hulled vessel to carry oil across the, you know, wherever it is. Um, there's very little anyone can do about it. Everyone knows it's wrong, it's internationally disapproved of. And the same thing, I think, if, if you can do that with large, obvious ships, when I mean, you think about data, uh, one, is, one is, of course, infinitely, has infinitely more opportunities to, to have these kind of subversions of any agreed international regulations taking place. So there's a real problem with, with how one deals with international or, or transnational issues in this area. And I would say as a proponent of international law, and then I teach it, and I mean, I'll, I'll, I celebrate it. I would international law would be the last place I'd go to try <laughs> to deal with this because it's the lowest common denominator problem. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, conventions adopted by uh, by consensus, and the consensus usually is pretty low. Um, and so, if anything, it would it would it would reduce the standards that we enjoy. Uh, I think at the national level. So. Audience questions. <laughs> Bonjour, je m'appelle Sophie, je travaille au commissariat. So, Sophie, I work at the uh, commission uh, and uh, uh, we uh, talked uh, today about our capacity to seize and to safeguard information. But uh, did your team uh, analyze information and, uh, and whatever your answer, um, uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, is, a, is, a, uh, raw, is raw data uh, worse than, worse than uh, analyzed data? Yeah. We well, they are, both, they are both advancing, but also in some ways behind. And one of the reasons why data warehousing is, is so popular is because of the idea that in the future, techniques will be developed which will be able to retrospectively, as you said, archaeologically analyze this data. However, analytics, and especially uh, cross-platform analytics, which combines a video analysis with other forms of data analysis, are improving. And this is one of the reasons why, again, the FBI has established this data warehouse and why other organizations are doing a similar, similar things. And analytics is, is really if you, where it's, if you like, the, the area of most growth in some ways. Um, and yeah, the, the big problem again is with this is the compatibility of different kinds of information. Uh, it's very, very hard even, for example, to take different um, video feeds, for example, and try to put them through a similar pattern of analysis if, they, if they're collected in a different way, stored in a different way. Uh, yeah, there's a problem of international standards, and that kind of protects us in this case. <laughs>
Um, but we shouldn't rely on those kind of things to protect us. The inadequacy of technology is only ever a temporary protection for privacy. So yes, the answer is yes, analysis is improving. But no, it's not quite. It depends who you're talking about as well. Of course, intelligence agencies have a far greater capacity for analysis than other organizations. So you know, I, I studied the NSA as part of my PhD, and I can't even imagine what kind of capacities they have now, given what I know they had 10 years ago. Uh, but those things will not be available even to other parts of government. So it varies. And I would just add that I, there's some peril on, in half-baked analysis as well, the, the partial portrait that may be painted from the database, uh, which may refine and, and reinforce pre-expectations of the tunnel vision. And there's actually an argument that's been made by, by critics of surveillance that says that, in fact, flawed surveillance is worse than the, in some ways than complete surveillance. Because you know, actually being wrong can be being wrong, and, and people who don't deserve what's coming to them is actually worse than uh, than actually having complete surveillance and then complete knowledge. I'm not sure I buy that because it, it obviously is a, an argument for complete surveillance, really. But it, it certainly makes logical sense. What the heck? Uh, David Elder, Steichen Elliott. Um, I'm, I'm still looking at the slide up here, and, and in particular, I'm looking at um, warrants and minimization. And we've been talking a lot about databases, big databases and data farms, and databases that are created largely by others. And I'm wondering about the databases we create ourselves, and in many case, cases, carry around with us on smartphones and tablets and PCs. And I'm thinking of sort of two topical situations where there is warrantless access to that sort of information, one in the context of an incidental search, um, and the other obviously with um, someone crossing a border. So I guess first, I, I, my, I would just ask for a comment on that issue, but the, the narrower question I think would be, is there a path forward, is there a, a realistic way of applying the principle of minimization um, to either of those scenarios where arguably there may be some narrower legitimate need or reason to look at that material, um, but is there a realistic uh, a solution for law enforcement or border agencies through that? Well, you know, this conventional understanding we have about the border being, well, wild. That that uh, you know the, the full, the full ambit of privacy protections don't extend to the border in terms of search and seizure. I mean that that's a product of a bygone era in many respects. When you're talking about a data dump, I mean I know your your firm has probably received instruction that uh, when you cross the U.S. border, you have sanitized hard hard drives because of the prospect that everything on it is going to be downloaded, including client confidential information. Um, you know there are these spaces, if you will, um, spaces of expediency where the, the premise behind, I suppose, weakened privacy protection of the border has been one about basically customs, right? About uh, immigration and customs. But here it's used essentially as a stalking horse for a broader national security preoccupation, which may only incidentally be related to immigration and customs. And you know, we all hear the stories about um, the, the lawyers who are involved in controversial cases uh, who suddenly are in receipt of extra special treatment when they are, arrive back from travels overseas and uh, their computers are examined closely. And you know, there's, it becomes, there's a prospect of a form of harassment, um, a disruption tactic, if you will, directed at the wrong people. Um, and so the answer in part is to recognize in the modern environment this notion that the border is some special zone in which these rights don't extend in full form, that's an adequate notion that needs to to, to, to go, it has to, it, the, the privacy protection should extend to that sort of environment as well. Um, I mean, that's my short answer. I, I don't know if I can give you a better answer. Do I think the Supreme Court's going to do that? No, uh, because of these entrenched expectations. But uh, I mean, I, that would be my preferred course of action. Of course, you could always uh, give your data to Apple or Google and keep it in the cloud. I'm sure they would look after it for you. Um, well, I mean, that, that's in some ways, it's it's a it's a silly point, but. At the same time, there is certainly out there a market opening up for secure um, server farms that do not uh, bow to government demands to give over their information. And that certainly might be in the same way that open access and open source 
has worked in other ways. There might well be a role for an open, you know, kind of a kind of confidential cloud operated by people who support these kind of things. But again, one I think would immediately, should that happen, see regulation brought in that would actually outlaw the use of these kinds of systems. You'd see it happening pretty quickly, uh, as has happened in other areas. We'd see it as part of, you know, there'd be some excuse like pr property rights or, or confidentiality or even just basic security issues. I don't know. There'd be various things that would come into play, but yeah. So I have to come. I'm not an expert on laws. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, for your remarks. And you both, of course, touched on the role of law um, as a norm setter and uh, the role of privacy commissioners as the those who try to apply the law and uh, who attempt to regulate all these new phenomena. Um, and you've given us many, many uh, very valuable insights and uh, extremely interesting ideas going forward. Um, what are your comments on the fact that I think many regulators recognize these phenomena, perhaps not with the acuity that you do, um, struggle with the existing regulations that they have to apply and um, are, as a group, not very successful in getting the normative framework which, with which they have to work um, changed in order to apply it um, in a more um, appropriate way or, or to apply more appropriate standards. I just referred now to my my colleague, the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Alberta, who's taken, who's requested leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada on a rather surprising question, uh, which one would have thought was clear about 20 years ago, but it's whether um, license plate information is personal information. So, you know, let alone deal with nano dust. Uh, so I wondered what your advice was to the community of regulators, given the context in which we work. This reminds me of the, um, soon after we published the report on the Surveillance Society in Britain, which was a, a report by the Information Commissioner there, um, I was invited to brief the House of Lords Constitution Committee on matters of future surveillance technology. Um, and. That was an occasion on which all the stereotypes one has of stuffy government people out of touch suddenly came to life. Um, after I'd finished giving my talk, the first response was a, an old gentleman, I can't remember which lord he was, who querulously said from the back, can they really do that? <laughs> and it was at the level where this, this guy was just so totally out of his depth. And most of the members of the committee, even those who had some moderate facility with technology, were so far behind in what, what they knew was happening in the world. I mean, these are people who, to whom, you know, Facebook was a completely, you know, something they had no idea about, that they had probably only just worked out that they couldn't program their VCRs from the 1980s. You know, this is, it was, and the lack of technical facility and expertise within government is, is a serious problem, actually, within, 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 within parliaments here. Um, it, when it's time it gets down to privacy commissioners, yes, surely there are people who have technical expertise, but the people who make the laws that you have to operate under are generally people who do not have that kind of expertise and knowledge, and actually are not very good at listening to those who do either, because they don't actually understand what is being told to them in many cases. You look at the numbers of people who have scientific qualifications, who are MPs, for example. It's very, very small. I mean, Kingston's actually very unusual. We just elected an MP who was a scientist. I think he may well be one of the only ones. And of course, it was immediately made the scientific spokesperson for the party he was elected for, because that's so unusual. Um, so there's a real problem there with regulators in essentially lacking the knowledge and lacking the understanding of how to deal with the knowledge when it's given to them. Uh, and, and this is a real issue. I'm not quite sure what to do about that, um, other than to, and, and to elect some different people to parliament. And this is a serious point. There are now parties evolving which have expertise in new technologies. Some of them may represent particular positions. One can think of the Pirate Party in Sweden, which uh, certainly has expertise and a very particular position and did indeed get people elected precisely because they argued that no one understood the world of contemporary networking technologies and computing. And a lot of people seem to agree with that. But other than that, we've, you've got this legacy of people who've been in Parliament for a very long time who don't have the necessary background. Many of them have legal backgrounds, but that's a whole different <laughs> question. They certainly don't have technical backgrounds, and that's a real problem. It's one, one answer. 
I don't know that there's a silver bullet. I, I think that I would echo the, the concern about the level of knowledge and, and uh, frankly, attention to these issues that, that one can galvanize in, a, in our current system. I, I think one of the more successful efforts in recent time to sort of bring to the forefront a, a, a highly scientific and technical issue was what environmental defense did when they had a bunch of MPs take uh, a blood test as to all the toxins which were in their, in their blood. And that put toxins on the top of the Tory agenda. So, you know, my advice may be for the information commissioner's office or the uh, privacy commissioner's office is uh, find out as much information you can about the MPs without violating any privacy <laughs> law and your submissions consist of the portfolio that you can build on each of these people you're appearing before without transgressing the current law. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can tell you that they will then be attentive uh, in ways that they weren't in the past. <laughs> We have time for a couple more questions, if anyone uh, out there has any. Uh, I, I have one in, in the absence of that. I mean, I, I was asking, or I think we brought up earlier, and, and it was alluded to during the talk. Um, it's not really on topic per se, but this phenomenon now that we, we are seeing out in Vancouver, uh, the issue of, of here is a, you know, set aside the question of government surveillance. This is, you know, um, us doing it to ourselves, you know, um, the, the, the democratization, this is the ugly side of the democratization of surveillance, I guess, is that when everyone carries around a surveillance tool uh, and goes to mass events and then things go horribly awry and like, as you were saying, none of this is ever forgotten once it's uploaded. Uh, so there is no attempt to minimize uh, or firewall. You know, what is a is this an area where you know governments, far from having to 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 wade in to find the bad guys, are now having the bad guys provided to them on a silver platter? Like, well, how do governments respond to this? I mean, think of some of the police forces out in um, uh, in Vancouver who were initially, you know, asking the public to to help, are now urging the public to please calm down. Um, you know, how, this kind of phenomenon, what, what role does, what role does government have to play here? And not, this isn't specific to, to our office, this is specific to the, what role does the government have in keeping the Wild West from getting really wild? Do you want to start? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know that I have any particular insight. I mean, the Vancouver case is a bit, a bit unusual, I would think, in the sense that it is, uh, uh, these were individuals who obviously ran amok uh, and are now on the receiving end of, of public disgust, in essence. And so there's sort of a, what do you call it, sort of a cyber vigilanteism associated with outing these individuals. Uh, um, from, a, from, the pers from a privacy protection perspective, the thing that I think might be more concerning would be, say, oh, um, the propensity of individuals to record the conduct of other individuals, to have that in their possession, and the government wanting to get a hold of this privatized surveillance footage, if you will, uh, that's not in the hands of a corporation uh, that's equipped to fight at length in court about you know, the Googles of the world that are in a position to actually stave off, uh, if they wish, uh, un unwarranted invasions, but the individual who can be cowed into cooperating and essentially become a de facto informant of sorts, sort of after the fact informant. Um, you know, the, the, the range of individuals now who are of potential interest because their sources of information is much vaster because of the amount of information that they can archive and collect and have on their person on a permanent basis. Um, that I think is a, a quite a pressing uh, concern or problem potentially. Uh, and so you know, what, what controls are there over the, the influence that a government can assert in relation to an individual to cause them to cough up this, this information, sometimes very vulnerable individuals. Um, it, it's the same scenario essentially as having someone turn state's evidence, except now that person could be fairly far removed from the actual matter that's being investigated. Uh, they're simply, a, I guess, in the American parlance, a material witness, um, but they have data that the government wants to get a hold of. Um, I, I, I see that as being a potentially more endemic problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it's that unusual, actually, though. I, I, think, I think maybe it's unusual in Canada. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've had these conflicts over, basically, if you like, image wars, which have been going on in Britain for some time over, and 
I'm not quite sure if there's an easy place to stand on this, because on the one side, um, I've been uh, supporting the efforts, for example, of photographers in Britain to stop the government from, especially the police in London, from trying to harass them and, 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 and you know, stop them taking pictures in public. And we, uh, we have established that there is a right for people to take pictures in public places. And in fact, that's a right enjoyed by ordinary citizens in many ways to hold governments and hold agents of governments to account. And it's been used that way. In fact, we've been celebrating this kind of use of social networking to facilitate holding governments to account across the Middle East and as well as in, 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 in Western countries. So that's the one side. And on the other hand, you know, we come across incidences like in the G20 when people who were not necessarily guilty of anything at all, apart from just being in a particular place, were hunted down um, for largely spurious charges, as we've seen. Most of them have been dropped. But in that case, again, it was ordinary people who provided the images to the police to identify these people. And they didn't do so because they were coerced by the police or anybody else. They voluntarily provided these images. And this comes down in the end to politics, people's political persuasions. If they believe that what they were doing, you know, the people who they were basically informing on were wrong, politically wrong, they will quite happily give this information to the government. It doesn't need coercion. It doesn't need any kind of, uh, you know, intervention, unfortunately, of the law in any way at all in this case. And of course, the government never needs, the government agency never needs to reveal sources of this information because it's largely only used in identification of people, not in evidence in court. It very rarely comes to that point. So you've got a very, I think it's just a situation where we're basically living with the pervasiveness, is the pervasive flow of our image around the place. And we've seen with Facebook recently and their new systems, which everybody's now talking about, of using facial recognition across their system just how much our images are circulating out there and can now be identified um, by various people, that this one seems to be something that has happened, been happening for some time, it's been creeping up, but we haven't actually, again, managed to get a hold on regulating it, and now it's almost too late to do anything about that. In fact, even if we were going to do something about it, what would we do? Because it would contradict other uh, rights and freedoms that we hold dear, especially the right to photograph in public and to you know, collect information ourselves, which is indeed a right which we have. So it's a problematic one. Um, and I don't know if there's a simple answer to it at all. Heather Black, I'm a retired regulator. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess my question is really directed to David. Uh, you had a question under your key questions. Um, how do these technologies, these surveillance technologies, affect the way we see ourselves and uh, the notion of trust? And I mean, CCTV, for example, has proved to be astonishingly ineffective in law enforcement. and. Obviously, a lot of money is now going into the development of, you know, 21st century fairy dust and uh, angry hummingbirds. Um, uh, whose interest is being served uh, in the development of technologies like this? Is, is it necessarily the state or is it supra sort of above the state? I think you have to step back a bit. I'll, I'll try not to do this in less than try to do this in less than five minutes. But I think you have to step back to the end of the Cold War first of all, and look at what happened when the Cold War ended, and when companies involved in defense research were forced to diversify effectively to survive. And you had a massive explosion of, of kind of blue sky research, which was actually not aimed anymore simply at military ends, but at a vast variety of potential ends. Um, and this kind of you know proliferation of, of technological research looking for markets, essentially, has, has persisted. Um, I think what you're seeing here is, a, is a, essentially an inventor's market, a market for all kinds of technologies, have all kinds of applications that people are more than willing to use because everybody, whether it's governments, corporations, individuals, are looking for that silver bullet, that thing that's going to solve the problem, and whether it be a personal problem right up to a governmental security problem. So you've essentially got a, a highly fast-moving a tensely profitable market. And the security market throughout the world is one of the few sectors that's grown pers consistently even in the recession. It's absolutely massive. It's an enormous, it's hard to estimate how big it is, but it's absolutely enormous. So 
I think fundamentally behind all these developments, you're seeing an increasingly diverse and profitable um, marketplace in, in security devices working at all levels. Um, that's one thing. Um, and so in some ways, you're not, it's not being driven by government per se, although it's obviously feeding into and playing off government priorities. But it's something that actually, of course, is itself driving government priorities. And if MPs and, and people in government don't listen to technical experts, they certainly listen to marketing people. Uh, and you often find, and I often find when I've talked to people at those kind of level, they've already had the talks from people who sell the technology. They've got there first. You know, they've already got in there and told them what their technology can do. And of course, that's, that's a much more persuasive argument than, oh, by the way, this might have some unintended social consequences. Please be careful. That's not a very persuasive argument compared to, look at this thing we developed. This will stop crime. And then however many times that, that, is, that is heard and proved not to be true in any particular case, there will be something else that will solve that problem or maybe resolve the issues created with the first one. There's an ongoing logic which says, this technology will solve the problem, and if it doesn't, something else will. Um, and all you have to do is keep buying these things until you find the right one that comes along. I mean, CCTV is very interesting as a case in point. As you rightly point out, it's remarkably ineffective compared to the claims that were made for it when it was first introduced. On the other hand, it has made massive transformations, though. And those transformations are not in law enforcement per se, but in culture. And so if you want to know what CCTV has done, it's changed us. It's changed how we think about ourselves, how we understand our performance in public, if you like, and what we do. And in many cases, it's, um, this has been something that people have played with. Even people who are active against CCTV often do it in a very playful way, which doesn't really seem to counteract the technology. It actually seems to enforce you know, the, the joy, in some ways, of, of playing with this technology. If you look at people like the surveillance camera players or some of these well-known activist groups, they're not really challenging the technology. They're actually using it. In some ways, it's celebrating it. And, and in a sense, this has become sort of part of our social performance now. I remember an adver advertisement that came out back in the early 90s or mid-90s when CCTV was first around in Britain, which said, basically, CCTV is everywhere. Are you dressed for it? <laughs> and this was the kind of, in fact, this seems to be the kind of predominant attitude that's evolved through this, that this is about, it's something that's encouraged kind of performance. Uh, and if you like, we love it. We love CCTV in that kind of cultural sense, whether we think we actually oppose it in a political sense or not. Um, and a lot of these things I showed you, these little devices, they're great. Aren't they fantastic? Little nano hummingbird, isn't it awesome? If you look at the demonstrations of it, everybody who sees it is sitting there fascinated by this amazing thing. It's just so cool. But yet, but yet, and this is unfortunately, you know, with technology, there is this incredible sort of sort of geek fascination with technology that whatever it does, it is fascinating and somehow before it becomes disturbing. And that's a problem too, culturally, I think. So it's a very range, wide ranging sort of <laughs> thing, sorry. I'm going to ask uh, the Assistant Privacy Commissioner to come up and uh, take us out. <laughs> um, but uh, please, but before that, I would I would love to just thank very quickly um, uh, Craig and David for coming today. I would also like to thank uh, the organizers internally, um, Aaron and Daphne uh, and Mel and everyone, and Todd, uh, who helped put this together. Thank you so much. It's a lot of work. Thank you. Yeah. Merci beaucoup, Chris. À toi aussi. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, uh, for helping us uh, throughout uh, these uh, discussions, which were quite fascinating. I uh, uh, really appreciated uh, what the speaker said. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, four uh, uh, elements that I found quite uh, interesting in regards to uh, public uh, safety. Uh, the first uh, phenomenon is, uh, David explained it very well, is this increasing uh, capacity to uh, for surveillance the second one and Craig uh, explained it very thoroughly is the lack of legislative framework uh, 
uh, in regards again to this uh, surveillance. Uh, thirdly, it, well, it is the consequences uh, pertaining to uh, personal information which is uh, obtained by governments. It, this information is uh, held by the most powerful uh, entities in our uh, society. And uh, fourthly, uh, something worries me. Uh, it is this uh, very important uh, aspect of security, public security. It's an imperative. We are uh, too complacent, uh, and uh, as it was very well explained, uh, to a certain extent, we are helpless before it. But I'd like to mention, to a certain degree, we are helpless, because uh, you brought uh, forward some very uh, interesting solutions. Solution that you've put to us, or options for solutions that you've put to us, we will take back and work on, and I know it can lead us to responding to the very new and important challenges that you have raised. So thank you very much. I think that was extremely helpful. In closing, I'd like to remind you that we will get together again on September 8th, and that time we're going to address the issue of youth privacy. I would like to invite you to join us again on the 8th of September. Helpful. Merci beaucoup.